Hi everybody, welcome back to Teen Storytime. Today we are going to be continuing reading The Western Game by Ellen Raskin. And we are now on chapter 15 and it is called Fact and Gossip. We are now halfway through the book and I hope you guys are enjoying it so far. Friday was back to normal if the actions of suspicious would-be heirs competing for a $200 million prize could be considered normal. At school, Theo studied, Doug who ran, and Turtle was twice sent to the principal's office for having been caught with a transistor radio plugged in her ear. The coffee shop was full of diners. Shin Hu's restaurant had reopened too, but no one came. JJ Ford presided at the bench and Sandy McSuthers presided at the front door, whistling and chatting, collecting tidbits of gossip and adding some of his own. Flora Bombach, her strained eyes shielded by dark glasses, drove Turtle to school on her way to the broker's office and picked her up in the late afternoon with a sheet of prices copied from the moving tape. They had lost $3,000 in five days. Paper losses, Turtle said. Doesn't mean a thing. Besides, I didn't pick these stocks. Mr. Westing did. Did he? The dressmaker thought of the clue Chris had dropped. No stock symbol had five letters or even resembled the word plain. But Flora Bombach played fair and kept the secret to herself. Four people stood in the driveways, melting snow, shivering as the sun dropped behind sunset towers. The fifth jogged in place. No smoke had risen from the chimney since that fateful Halloween. Still, they stared up at the Westinghouse, murder on their minds. He looked too peaceful to have been murdered, Turtle said. She sneezed and Sandy handed her a Weston tissue. How would you know, Doug replied. How many people have you seen murdered? Turtle's right, her friend Sandy said. If Westing expected it, he'd have seen it coming. His face would have looked scared. Maybe he didn't see it coming, Theo argued. The killer was very cunning, Westing said. I read a mystery once where the victim was allergic to bee stings and the murderer let a bee in through an open window. The window wasn't open, Turtle said, wiping her nose. Besides, Westing would have heard the buzzing and jumped out of bed. Doug Who had an idea. Maybe the murderer injected bee venom into his veins. Otis Amber flung his arms in the air. Whoever said Sam Westing was allergic to bees? Doug tried again. How about snake venom? Or poison? Doctors know lots of, but of poison that makes it look like a heart attack. Turtle almost kicked Doug, track meat or not. Her father was a doctor. That'd be a crappy way to die. Baby Westing was just sleeping until Turtle stumbled and fell on his head, Doug suggested. That's not funny, Doug Who. How could she ever have had a crush on that disgusting jerk? Doug would not let up. And who was that suspicious person in red boots I saw opening the hoods of the cars in the parking lot the other morning? He looked at Turtle's booted feet. The thief stole my boots and put them back again. The leak. Oh, likely story, Tabitha Ruth. Doug pulled her braid and ran into the lobby at full speed. Sandy placed a large hand on Turtle's shoulder, comforting hand, and a restraining one. Otis Amber hopped on his bike. Can't stand around chit-chatting about murder that never happened. Sam Westing was a madman. Insane. Crazy as a bedbug. He pedaled off, shouting back, We ain't murderers, and none of us. Theo could not agree. If there was no murderer, there was no answer. And without an answer, no one could win. Sandy, did anyone leave Sunset Towers on Halloween night before Turtle and Doug? The doorman scratched his head under his hat, thinking, one day seems like the next, people coming and going. I can't remember. Try. Sandy scratched harder. Only ones I can recall are Otis Amber and Crow. They left together about five o'clock. Thanks. Theo hurried into the building to check his clues. Turtle had no reason to suspect Otis Amber or Crow or any of the heirs. Money was the answer. Her only problem was that dumb stock market and it didn't want to play the game. Sandy, tell me another story. Okay, let's see. Once long ago in the olden days, there was a soothsayer who predicted the day of his own death. The day came and the soothsayer waited to die and waited some more, but nothing happened. He was so surprised and so happy to be alive, he laughed and laughed. Then at one minute to midnight, he suddenly died. He died laughing. <sighs> he died laughing, Turtle repeated thoughtfully. That's profound, Sandy. It's very profound. Where is everybody? The apartment was empty, as usual. Jake Wexler decided that Shin Hu's was going to have a paying customer. I'd like a table, if you're not too crowded. I think I can squeeze you in, Who said, leading the podiatrist through the empty restaurant. You must have liked those spare ribs. Yeah, sure. Jake watched his wife slowly stack her papers at the reservation desk. 
At last, seeming to recognize him, she walked over. Jake returned his unlit cigar to his pocket. Grace hated the smell. I've already eaten, Grace said, sitting down. Hello to you, too, Jake replied. He probably thinks that's funny, since when you go around people saying hello to their husbands. What's new with you, Grace? Where are the kids? What are all those presents doing on the coffee table? It's not your birthday and it's not our anniversary. What was she so upset about? Or is it? No, it isn't. Those are gifts for Angela. The wedding shower is tomorrow. Don't worry, you're not supposed to be there, just girls. The doorbell was ringing all morning and I couldn't have leave the apartment for an instant. One at a time he delivered them, the smirking fool. Each time he shouted, BOOM! <laughs> she looked especially attractive today, Jake thought. Between the ringing doorbell and the, broom, and the booms, she had managed time for the beauty parlor and the sun lamp. Mr. Who set the spare ribs on the table and lowered himself to a chair. Grace lost her scowl. Since you're here, Jake, I'd like your opinion on the advertising campaign I'm planning. Jamie and I are having a slight disagreement. I say that Shin Who's sounds like every other Chinese restaurant to English-speaking ears. English-speaking ears? Jake bit his lip in an effort to keep silent. I say the restaurant needs a name people won't forget grace continued a name like who's on first jake could not help himself he tried to cover a loud cough with loud with louder coughing who pounded him on the back and apologized for the ginger you remember that old baseball routine jake grace prompted yes he did who's on second no what's on second who's on first it's an idiotic name, who agreed. Who's on first sounds like my restaurant is on the first street, or worse yet, on the first floor. Customers will end up in the coffee shop drinking dishwater tea. Not the way I'll promote it, they won't, Grace insisted. Well, what's your opinion, Jake? The podiatrist put down a spare rib that he was about to bite into. Who's on first is a dandy name. Before he could pick up the rib again, who whisked the plate off the table? Who would like to you judge anyhow? The judge returned sun to Sunset Towers with clippings from the newspaper's files. Faithful Sandy was waiting. Hoping to inter interrogate both George Theodorakis and James Shin Hu, they alternated their dinner orders. One night they would order up, the next night they would order down. To their disappointment, Theo delivered up. They had no questions to ask him, but he had one for the doorman. Chess, Sandy replied. Sorry, I don't know the game. I'm a whiz at hearts, though. Shooter, they call me. Theo left them to their sandwiches and their work. The private, the private detective the judge had hired was still investigating the heirs, so tonight's project would be the Westing family. Judge Ford opened the thin folder on Mrs. Westing. Oh, the thin folder on Mrs. Westing. Mrs. Westing, no first name, no maiden name. In the few paper, newspaper photographs in which she appeared always with her husband, the captions read, Mr. and Mrs. Samuel W. Westing. A shadowy figure, a shy woman, she seemed to slip behind her husband before the camera clicked or had her face masked by a floppy hat brim. A slim woman dressed in the fashion of the time, long, loose chemise, narrow shoes with sharply pointed toes and high spiked heels. A nervous woman, her hands, especially in the later pictures, were blurred. In the final photograph, a black veil covered her face. She seemed to lean unsteadily against the stocky frame of her husband as they left the cemetery. Sandy reported his findings. Jimmy Hu never met Mrs. Westing. Neither did Flora Bombach. She says Violet's fiance brought her to the shop for the fittings. She says it's bad luck for a groom to see the bride in the wedding gown before the wedding. I guess she's right. Well, that's it. Nobody else admits to having known Mrs. Westing except me. You knew her, Mr. McSuthers? The judge asked. Well, not exactly, but I saw her once or twice. The doorman described Mrs. Westing as blonde, full-lipped, a good figure, though on the skinny side. Mostly I recall those full lips because she had a mole right here. He pointed to the right corner of his mouth. Judge Ford did not remember a mole. She remembered copper-colored hair and thin lips, but it was so long ago and, well, Mrs. Westing was white. Very white. The judge studied the photograph under the headline, Violet Westing to Mary Senator. The senator turned out to be a state senator, a hack pol politician now serving a five-year jail term for bribery. But Flora Bombach was right about the resemblance. Violet Westing did look like Angela Wexler. That was George Theodoric is all right, dancing with her in the society clippings, society page clippings. 
What does it all mean, Judge? Sandy asked, squinting at the pictures through his smeared glasses. Angelo looks like Westing's daughter, and Theo looks like his father. The man Violet Westing really wanted to marry. How do you know that? Sandy shrugged. It was common gossip at the time that Westing's daughter killed herself rather than have to marry that crooked politician. Now the judge remembered. Her mother had written her about the tragedy. Tell me, Mc tell me, Mr. McSouthers, you seem to know what's going on in this building. Is Angela Wexler involved with Theo in any way? Oh, no. Sandy was certain of that. Angela and her intern seemed happy enough with each other. At least, I hope so. I mean, if Sam Westing wanted to replay that terrible drama, Angela Wexler would have to die. Chapter 16. The Third Bomb. Boom! Grace Wexler slammed the door on the delivery boy's silly face and returned to her party with a pink ribbon gift. The gossiping guests were sipping jasmine tea from the Westing Paper Party Cups, nibbling on tidbits from Westing Paper Party Plates, and wiping their fingers on Westing Paper Party napkins. Madame Hu served in a tight-fitting silk gown slit high up to her thigh, a costume as old-fashioned and impractical as bound feet. Women in China wore blouses and pants and jackets. That's what she would wear when she got home. Grace clapped her hands for attention. Girls, girls, it's time for the bride-to-be to open her presents. Angela, you sit here and everybody gather around. Angela did as her mother said. She lowered herself to a cushion on the floor, ringed by gift boxes and surrounded by vaguely familiar faces. She had not invited her few friends from college. They were bent on careers. This wasn't their thing. These were her mother's friends, and the newly married daughters of her mother's friends, and Turtle, who was leaning against the wall, arms folded, smirking. Lucky Turtle, the neglected child. Read it out loud, dear, Grace ordered as Angela opened the card tied to the yellow ribbon box. To the bride-to-be in the kitchen stuck an asparagus cooker and lots of luck. From Cookie Barf Springer. <laughs> Thank you, Angela said, wondering which one was Barf Springer. The next gift was an egg poacher. The pink, the box in pink ribbons contained another asparagus cooker. I sure hope Dr. Deer likes asparagus, someone remarked. The giver said she could return it for something else, although two might come in handy. A doctor's wife has so much entertaining to do. Angela glanced at her watch and reached for the tall, thin carton wrapped in gold foil. Look how Angela's hands are shaking. She's nervous as the groom. Giggles. Bright to be jitters. More giggles. Slowly, Angela unknotted the gold ribbon. Carefully, she unfolded the gold foil. How neatly she did everything, the perfect child, not like Turtle, who ripped off wrappings impatient to see what was inside. Hurry up, Angela. Angela, you're such a poke, Turtle complained. Suddenly, there she was, kneeling down under the kneeling down to peek under the lid. Get away, Angela cried, jerking the gift up away from her sister as the lid blasted off with a shattering bang, 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 a rapid rat -a -ta -ta. Rocket, rockets shooting, fireballs bursting, comets shrieking, sparks sizzling, two dozen framed flower prints falling off the wall. Then it was over. Screams hushed to whimpers and the trembling guests crawled out from under tables and peered out of closets. Is anyone hurt? Grace Wexler asked nervously, other than, being, other than being scared out of ten years of their lives. Thank you, they were fine. Where's Angela? Angela was still seated on the cushion in the middle of the floor. Fragments of the scorched box lay in her burned hands. Blood oozed from an angry gash on her cheek and trickled down her beautiful face. Heirs, beware. Sam Weston had warned. They should have listened. Now it was too late. Suspicious heirs gathered in the lobby around the police captain called in by Judge Ford. One of them was a murderer, they thought, and one was a bomber, and one of them was a thief. But which was which and who was who? Or could it be one and the same? Some game, Mr. Who grumbled, unwrapping a chocolate bar. One ulcer wasn't enough. Sam Westing had to give him three more. Some game. The last one alive wins. Now, there's a likely suspect, Otis Amber thought. Who? The inventor. Who? The angry man. The madman. The last one alive wins, Flora Bombach repeated. Oh my, what a terrible thing to say. Can't trust that dressmaker, Mr. Who thought. How come she's grinning like that all the time? The captain offered no help at all. 
Neither the bomb squad or the burglary detail has enough evidence to search the apartments, he explained. You call that justice? Sandy asked. Good nature Sandy couldn't be the one. He wasn't in the building when the first two bombs went off, or when the judge's watch was stolen, Jake Wexler thought. On the other hand, he sure did hate Sam Westing. Yes, Mr. McSouthers, justice is exactly what I call it. Not her, not the judge, in spite of the clues, Chris thought. Unless she's one of those Black Panthers in disguise. Those weren't gas explosions, those were bombs, right? Theo pressed the captain. A nice kid, that Theo dug, dug to, Flora Bombach thought. But how often had she seen television interviews of, neighbor, of next door neighbors saying, Can't believe he killed 13 people, he was such a nice kid. Oh my, oh my, what's gotten into me thinking such a thing? The captain would not call them bombs. More like childish pranks, he said. Childish pranks? That brat's capable of anything. Turtle stuck her tongue out at the sneering dog hoop. Evil pranks of the devil, Crow muttered. Her blessed Angela was almost killed. Crow could be the one. Bring hellfire down on all of us. Theo whispered to Chris, but she wasn't in the building when the first two bombs went off. Yes, she, she was. No, she wasn't. The captain described the so-called bombs, just a few fireworks tri triggered by a squat striped candle set in a tall open jar. The ribbon probably hid the air holes in the box. No one would have been hurt if the young lady had not tilted the box toward herself. A time bomb, Grace Wexler said, glaring at the person who had delivered the gifts. An unhappy woman, that self-appointed heiress, the judge thought, unfulfilled, possibly disturbed. Capable of the burglaries, perhaps, but not the bombing. She wouldn't have hurt her own daughter. At least not Angela. Don't look at me like that, Otis Amber shouted at Mrs. Wexler. I don't own no striped candles or no fireworks neither. That idiot is the likeliest of all, Grace thought. But he wasn't around when the coffee shop blew up. Oog. Ah. The excitement was too much for Chris Theodorakis. That was one heir no one suspected. And Angela, of course. No one could suspect her. Otis Amber was not even sure of that. Still waters run deep, he said. He 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 he. He 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 he. Turtle could not let him get away with that, even if it was true. Otis Amber limps, Chris noted the next day. Her family kept reassuring her, you're going to be fine, Angela, just fine. The loud snore that erupted from the next hospital bed was Sidel Pulaski pretending to be asleep. I still don't remember, Angela mumbled. Her bandaged cheek made speaking difficult. Her face hurt, her hands hurt. Hurt very much. Traumatic amnesia, Jake Wexler said. It happens after sudden accidents. Don't worry, Angie Pie, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine, Angela, just fine, Grace said despondently. I'll be back tomorrow. Come, Turtle. In a minute. Turtle waited for the door to close. She touched her sister's bandaged hand. Thanks. For what? Another snore from Sidel. Just thanks. The fireworks would have gone off in my face if you hadn't pulled the box towards you. Here, I brought your tapestry bag. I didn't look at your notes or clues honest. But she had re removed the incriminating evidence. Turtle, tell me the truth. How bad is it? The doctor had to take some glass out of your hands, but no stitches. The burns will heal okay. My face? Some scarring, but not bad really, Angela. Besides, you are always said being pretty wasn't important. It's who you are that really counts. Angela wondered about that. Maybe she was wrong. Maybe pretty was important. Maybe she was crazy. She must have been crazy. Don't worry, you'll still be pretty, Turtle said. But wow, that was sure a dumb thing to do. Sidel Pulaski's eyes popped open in surprise. Quickly, she squeezed them shut and uttered another loud snore. Well, what do you know? Her sweet saintly partner was the bomber. Good for her. All right, I'm going to end it there, and next week we will be returning with the book, and we will be reading Chapter 17, Some Solutions. I hope you guys enjoyed that, and thanks so much for watching, guys. I'll see you guys next time. Bye!